Kusanagi turned around, his face beaming with a bright smile as he addressed Mizuwa. He extended an invitation, asking if she would be interested in joining him. Overwhelmed by the offer and touched by Kusanagi's presence by her side, Mizuwa took a moment to thoroughly consider her decision. With newfound confidence, she replied out loud, expressing her eagerness to participate. Kusanagi couldn't help but feel proud of Mizuwa's transformation and the way her spirits had been lifted. The two of them made a pact. If they emerged victorious, Ruka would no longer speak harshly to Mizuwa. Conversely, if Ruka's side won, Mizuwa would resign from the academy. Despite this resolution, Ruka couldn't resist adding some final intimidating remarks, reminding their opponents to be prepared to face the consequences of their actions. Their conversation shifted to the academy rooftop. Mizuwa, displaying her perseverance and determination, sought Kusanagi's guidance, expressing her desire to delve deeper into the study of magic. Kusanagi, puzzled by the sudden summons, maintained his pretense of being a weak and unremarkable mage with a mere 100 units of magic power. He questioned Mizuwa, asking if she was certain about being taught by someone like him. Mizuwa's sharp intuition, however, allowed her to see through Kusanagi's facade and recognize that he possessed hidden powers far beyond what he presented. Impressed by Mizuwa's intelligence and unwavering belief in his ability to help her become stronger, Kusanagi couldn't refuse her plea for assistance. He agreed to help her, setting the condition that she must follow his instructions and remain committed throughout their training. Mizuwa's enthusiasm and joy were palpable as she jumped with delight, overwhelmed by the prospect of Kusanagi's guidance. He assured her that he would never turn down her plea, impressed by her willingness to pursue strength. They recognized the importance of preparing for what lay ahead. To begin their training, Kusanagi asked Mizuwa how she defined magic power. Confidently, she explained that it was the energy inside a person's body necessary for performing magic. When asked about incantations, Mizuwa described them as programmed instructions that converted magic power into magic craft. She added that intentionally increasing a mage's magic power was impossible, as it was predetermined before birth and ceased to progress at a certain age. Kusanagi corrected Mizuwa's misconceptions, revealing that magic power extended beyond an individual's body and encompassed the energy present in the natural world. He explained that incantations were tools supporting magicraft and contradicted Mizuwa's belief by asserting that intentionally increasing magic power was indeed possible. This revelation left Mizuwa grappling with the realization that her understanding of magic had been flawed. Unfazed by her skepticism, Kusanagi remained determined to impart his knowledge and train her in the three fundamental aspects he had mentioned. To initiate their practical training, Kusanagi channeled his magic power into Mizuwa, instructing her to inform him once she sensed it. After a few attempts, Mizuwa finally felt a tingling sensation on her back, indicating her perception of magic power. Kusanagi explained the significance of this sensation and its role in detecting and harnessing magic power from the natural environment. Despite her initial confidence, Mizuwa struggled to master this skill, prompting her to seek help from Kusanagi. Determined to assist her, he intensified his efforts, pouring even more magic power into her. Finally, Mizuwa's eyes opened wide, and she realized she could see the magic power before her. Mizuwa stared at her aura in disbelief. She had finally mastered the ability to see magic, a skill she had been striving for. She turned her gaze towards Kusanagi hoping to perceive his magic power, but she couldn't understand why she could barely see it. Kusanagi praised her for achieving her first goal, and Mizuwa blushed, pretending that it had come naturally to her. With Mizuwa's newfound ability to sense magic, they moved on to their next training phase. Kusanagi instructed Mizuwa to learn how to adjust the amount of magic power she used, using magicraft with the appropriate amount of magic. He advised her to discard any unnecessary actions and focus on efficiency. Similarly, Mizuo was encouraged to push her magic power to its limits, knowing that it would increase after she recovered from depletion. Curious if their training would differ from the basic teachings of the academy, Mizuo asked Kusanagi. He reassured her that it was okay to doubt him, as he had always been truthful from the beginning. Mizuwa, however, had grown to trust him and vowed not to doubt him anymore. Kusanagi was pleased, and they moved forward to the next stage of training. Kusanagi instructed Mizuwa to step back as he took off his blazer, preparing to battle her. Mizuwa was excited to witness Akami's true powers. She unleashed a magic circle called the First Level of Aqua Sorcery, sending two swirling water projectiles towards Kusanagi. With a calm demeanor, Kusanagi used his shield power, resembling a honeycomb, to block Mizuwa's attack. Mizuwa was impressed by his abilities. Kusanagi referred to the power he had used as the First Level Nun Attributes Magic Barrier. 
He explained to Mizua that if she couldn't break through his shield, defeating her sister Ruka would be impossible. Determined, Mizua launched another attack, this time using ice bullets. However, Kusanagi effortlessly blocked her assault and advised her to keep moving while using her magic craft. He emphasized that stopping her movement would lead to defeat when facing a mage. Following their intense sparring session, Mizuo was exhausted. Kusanagi offered her a towel and observed that she had used too much magic power in an inefficient manner. He explained that once she learned to adjust her power, she wouldn't need any incantations. A mage could use magic craft as long as they had magic power. To demonstrate, Kusanagi showcased his own magic, producing a fiery burst. He then compared Mizuo's power to his own highlighting the dispersed nature of her magic craft. However, he reminded her that adjusting magic power was key. Mizua realized that she didn't need to chant incantations anymore. She understood the advantage of shortening her chants in battle, conserving magic power. Mizua realized that this knowledge could strengthen her magic craft. Kusanagi stood up and urged Mizua to start over, emphasizing the importance of practicing as if her life depended on it. Although terrified by his intensity, Mizua passed out from exhaustion. When Mizuo regained consciousness, Kusanagi reminded her that they would practice battle every day until she mastered his lessons. Later that night, Kusanagi roamed around Harajuku and sensed the presence of monsters. He noticed that their numbers remained constant despite extermination efforts. As he searched, he encountered a girl about to be attacked by a level 1 monster. Kusanagi swiftly eliminated the threat. But the girl, without saying a word, took a picture of him with tears in her eyes. Irritated by her lack of gratitude, Kusanagi considered wearing a mask in the future. The next day, Kusanagi and Mizua continued their training for the upcoming duel against Ruka. Mizua was consistently defeated, leaving her exhausted and panting on the ground. Kusanagi observed her progress, which was improving, but he knew she still lagged behind in various areas compared to her sister. He believed that there was no way for Mizua to win if she continued to be defeated by his level 1 barrier. Mizua, however, was resolute and courageous. She confessed to Kusanagi that she had always been compared to her sister and had given up on many things. But Magicraft was the one thing she refused to abandon. She implored Kusanagi to be stricter with her. Touched by her determination, Kusanagi warned her that she wouldn't be able to win in her current state. Mizua yelled at him to push her harder. Kusanagi was proud to see Mizua's unwavering spirit and commitment to becoming a better mage. He agreed to be stricter with her and pushed her to her limits. Both Mizua and Kusanagi trained tirelessly, battling each other repeatedly. Kusanagi continued to lecture Mizua about the proper usage of magic power. After numerous trials and errors, they engaged in another battle. This time, Mizua finally managed to break through Kusanaga's magic barrier and emerged victorious. Overjoyed with her success, Mizua collapsed on the ground in celebration. Kusanagi, who had doubted her before, felt a surge of pride witnessing Mizua's progress and hard work. Mizua smiled, her face beaming with accomplishment. The next day, Kusanagi and Mizua stood outside the academy, preparing for their duel against Ruka. However, their path was blocked by someone who approached them at the entrance. A swarm of media reporters showed interest in the upcoming duel between Mizua and Ruka. Mizua was dumbfounded by the presence of the press, who seemed to have inside information about the duel. Kusanagi realized that even a simple battle between students highlighted the importance of noble mage lineage. The duel was scheduled to take place in the school's coliseum, and the entire academy was eagerly anticipating the event. Kusanagi thought it might be overwhelming for other students to participate, but Mizua explained that magic duels were rare occurrences and treated like special events by the academy. Both Mizua and Kusanagi prepared themselves for the duel as their names were called by the announcer. Sensing Mizua's nervousness, Kusanagi called her name before she walked forward, cheering her on to do her best. Mizua's stage fright transformed into motivation, and she moved confidently towards the stage. As she walked, she noticed Akami, a mysterious person whose words resonated with her. Ruka and Mizua faced each other in the duel. Ruka tried to provoke Mizua by expressing surprise that she didn't run away. Mizua defiantly responded that she wouldn't back down. Ruka criticized Mizua for assuming she could win, especially against someone like her. Mizua shouted that she would definitely win, but Ruka observed that Mizua had made progress in the past two weeks. Mizua analyzed her sister and acknowledged the difference in their magic powers, seeing that Ruka's powers were stronger. Nevertheless, Mizua resolved to give her best. The duel commenced, and both Mizua and Ruka attacked each other. They both utilized the same magic, the first level of aqua sorcery, and their magic powers clashed. Surprisingly, Mizua managed to counteract Ruka's power, much to her own astonishment. 
Ruka acknowledged Mizua's progress and praised her, which touched Mizua deeply. However, Ruka quickly clarified that it was merely a comparison and not genuine praise. This provoked Mizua, but she remained determined. Ruka decided to increase her magic power, launching a relentless attack. Mizua struggled to defend herself until she could no longer withstand Ruka's onslaught and fell off the stage beside Akami. Kusanagi looked at Mizua, hoping she wouldn't give up. Based on his observations, Mizua had a higher chance of winning in terms of enchanting speed, but Ruka was simply stronger. Ruka criticized Kusanagi for not helping Mizua, despite having protected her before. Kusanagi defended his decision, stating that he didn't underestimate Mizua. Ruka was confused, but Mizua rose to continue the fight. This terrified Ruka as she watched her sister stand up after enduring her level 2 magic attack. Mizua repeatedly declared that she wouldn't give up. She emphasized that Magicraft was the one thing she held on to, even if she lost everything else. Mizua launched another attack against Ruka. The Mizua sisters fought fiercely, both using their magic powers. However, Mizua's body reached its limit, and she collapsed, refusing to give up. In the first round, Ruka emerged as the victor. Mizua hated herself on the ground for not being able to defeat her sister. Kusanagi approached Mizua to console her in her defeat. He noticed that the battle had been based on magic power adjustments, and Mizua simply lost in terms of the amount of magic power. Ruka hoped that Kusanagi could finally understand that Mizua had no talent. However, Kusanagi stood up and defended Mizua, recognizing her hard work. Mizua cried tears of joy upon hearing Kusanagi's unwavering belief in Hirvan after her defeat. Kusanagi told Ruka that Mizua was his disciple and expressed his displeasure whenever Ruka spoke ill of her sister. Mizua cried tears of happiness, feeling a renewed sense of hope and determination. Ruka felt frustrated and believed that Kusanagi was being overly confident, especially considering his magic power level of 100. Kusanagi, with an intimidating presence, asserted that he would defeat Ruka despite his magic power level. Ruka dismissed Kusanagi's words as nonsense, but she decided not to be his opponent for now. It was Ruji's turn to duel, and both he and Kusanagi were brimming with confidence. They believed that Kusanagi would defeat Ruji in a matter of seconds. Kusanagi carried Mizua off the stage, as she was exhausted, and advised her to pay attention to his battle to further hone her skills. Strangely, Mizua noticed that her body no longer hurt, and her wounds were healing. Kusanagi walked confidently to the stage, knowing that he could defeat Ryuji with his magic power level of 100. However, he acknowledged that he had to go all out and keep his magic power at 100 to stand a chance. He vowed to use non-attribute magic and proceed without incantations or setting up a magic barrier, even if it meant risking his life. He was thrilled to fight against two strong students. Ryuji and Kusanagi attempted to intimidate each other, both claiming not to hold back their power. As the match began, the crowd cheered for Ryuji, teasing Kusanagi to be gentle with his opponent. Ryuji unleashed his 8,000 magic power, while Kusanagi observed his aura and realized that it might pose a challenge. Despite using only 100 units of magic power, Kusanagi knew he could die if he let his guard down. However, he swiftly put Ryuji to sleep with just a touch of his finger. The crowd was astonished to see the match end so quickly, with Ryuji still lying unconscious. Kusanagi emerged as the victor. Ruka rushed to Ryuji's side, concerned for her friend. Kusanagi explained to Ruka that he had knocked out Ryuji with just one hit, without using any incantations. Ruka was in awe of Kusanagi's ability, but he continued to provoke her, stating that the match had ended quickly. Mizua, astonished by Kusanagi's prowess, realized that he was not someone to be underestimated. Ruka decided to challenge Kusanagi to a duel, and he observed her magic power of 10,000, which was stronger than Ryuji's. Kusanagi had gained attention with his quick defeat of Ryuji, and the third match would determine the winner of the duel. While Ruka chanted her magic, Kusanagi used the same attack he had used on Ryuji. He vowed to use low magicraft power for Mizua's sake. He aimed at Ruka's head, but she defended herself. Ruka noticed that Kusanagi didn't move or use any magic, unlike her sister Mizua. She analyzed Kusanagi but couldn't figure out how he remained unharmed without using any magic. The crowd couldn't take their eyes off Kusanagi as they saw Ruka's water magic hit him without affecting him. Mizua was amazed by Kusanagi's technique. Ruka attacked Kusanagi again, 
believing that he was using tricks. However, Kusanagi effortlessly dodged all her attacks. Ruka realized that Kusanagi was dodging without using any magic. Mizua listened to Kusanagi's advice and analyzed him using her own power. She realized that a mage could counteract Magicraft with another Magicraft, even with a difference in power. Ruka attacked Kusanagi once more with a powerful blow, but he dodged it using the same power he had used against Ryuji. Ruka was hit by her own power, but she remained conscious and asked Kusanagi how he was able to do it. Kusanagi explained that he used a magic drain to consume the Magicraft and walked through the center of Ruka's magic, explaining why he remained unharmed. The stage was demolished by Ruka's powerful attack, except for the path where Kusanagi had walked. Ruka was impressed by Kusanagi's ability and acknowledged her defeat in the duel. Accepting her loss, Ruka stood up and fulfilled her promise not to say anything harsh to Mizua and never to force her to quit school again. Kusanagi, who had been Mizua's teacher, proudly stated that she had grown stronger in just two weeks. He advised Ruka to stop being overprotective of her little sister. Mizua, filled with determination, promised to become stronger and relieve her sister's worries. The Mizua sisters shared a laugh, but their moment of respite was interrupted by a sudden sense of a strong power. The sky turned red, reminiscent of the calamity from the past. Kusanagi recognized the abnormal magic power and realized that the calamity was happening once again. Everyone was terrified by this ominous development. Meanwhile, inside the school building, Tadano and his friends were searching for something to expose Kusanagi, whom they believed had cheated in the duel. All they found were textbooks on Kusanagi's back. As they continued their search, one of Tadano's friends became terrified by something they saw. The sky turned red, signaling the return of the calamity. Tadano and his friends realized the gravity of the situation. The students in the academy trembled in fear as they witnessed and felt the magic of the calamity. However, some of them were in denial, refusing to believe that such an incident could happen again. Kusanagi, too, was terrified by the presence of the calamity. He remembered the previous calamity in Shinjuku and hoped that the current events were not a mere coincidence. Suddenly, three large portals opened, and three monsters emerged, causing panic among the students. They ran in fear while the teachers tried to calm them down. Kusanagi swiftly annihilated the monsters with his magic, which appeared as a glowing beam of light. Using his green magic circle as a microphone, he urged everyone to calm down and instructed them to evacuate to the gymnasium in groups, as it was dangerous to go alone. Kusanagi specifically told the Mizua sisters to evacuate, leaving Mizua wondering about his plans. He decided to take it upon himself to save the people in the school building. Despite the concerns of the teachers, Ruji volunteered to accompany Kusanagi, assuring the teacher that there would be no problems, as he had witnessed Kusanagi's capabilities before. The teacher understood Kusanagi's potential but worried about his students pushing themselves too far. As they prepared to go, Ruji bid farewell to Kusanagi and reminded him to be careful. Ruji then showcased his speed, boasting that he could run 100 meters in 10 seconds, questioning if Kusanagi could keep up. However, to Ruji's surprise, Kusanagi used his green magic circle to move even faster, leaving Ruji impressed by his monstrous speed. Motivated by Kusanagi's abilities, Ruji decided to closely observe Kusanagi's true power and save everyone along the way. Kusanagi sensed that there were 58 magic power users in the school building, but he was also concerned that there might be a human without any magic power. He leaped in front of the school building and began searching the entire school. He encountered monsters attempting to harm students and swiftly killed them with his magic. He protected the girls who were about to be attacked and ensured the safety of everyone he encountered. Meanwhile, Ruji guided their fellow schoolmates to the gymnasium, acting as a guard. However, one student noticed something behind them. Ruji saw their schoolmates falling from the building but floating safely due to magic protecting them. This made Ruji question Kusanaga's identity, suspecting that he possessed extraordinary powers. Despite his doubts, Kusanagi was glad to see Ruji capable of handling the situation on his own. Kusanagi sensed another student in danger, a girl surrounded by vicious monsters in the hallway. She was cornered and unable to devise an escape plan. Desperate for someone to save her, she screamed for help, glowing light that killed the monsters surrounding her. She was speechless, realizing that the magic she witnessed was the same as when she was saved in Shibuya. It was Kusanagi who appeared in front of her to check if she was okay. Connecting the dots, she asked if he was the one who saved her. Kusanagi confirmed it, but he didn't see it as anything special. The girl developed feelings for Kusanagi as she witnessed his kindness. Nuji rushed to the scene upon hearing the girl's scream, but Kusanagi guided her to follow Ruji for safety. 
The girl admired Kusanagi even more as he ran tirelessly to save others. Kusanagi's main goal was to ensure the safety of everyone in the building, regardless of personal recognition. The girl expressed her gratitude to Kusanagi for saving her twice, bowing her head in appreciation. Kusanagi humbly accepted her thanks. Kusanagi continued running as fast as he could, sensing the presence of more people in need of rescue. He had no time to wait for the police to arrive. Meanwhile, in a meeting, the Prime Minister announced the occurrence of the calamity at the Kamui Magic Academy. Questions arose among the attendees, as the calamity had not been seen in 50 years. The Prime Minister decided to contact the Beast Countermeasure Division of the Metropolitan Police Department and the Magic Nobles for assistance. He acknowledged that the Self-Defense Force lacked the necessary personnel skilled in battling monsters, as their focus had been on national defense and international affairs. The police and magic nobles swiftly arrived at the academy. They discussed the reappearance of the calamity and wondered how such an event could occur again. The policewoman, Sonata, expressed confidence that they would handle the situation easily, while the policeman, Shuru Shago, from the Beast Countermeasures Division, assured her that they had it under control. Reporters in a helicopter captured footage of the calamity unfolding at the academy. As they watched, they saw not only weak monsters but also flying soldier monsters roaming the campus. Inside the gymnasium, the teacher guided the students in defeating the monsters, impressing the viewers watching the news. However, two individuals watching the news became terrified as they realized the academy was near their location. More unfortunate events unfolded as monsters began to appear in the streets. Some children watched the news without fully grasping the seriousness of the situation, while the elderly were horrified, having experienced the calamity before. Back in the building, Kusanagi sensed that the number of monsters pouring in was increasing. He knew that stronger monsters would appear soon, marking the second stage of the calamity. Despite feeling burned out from his continuous efforts to annihilate monsters and save people, Kusanagi persevered. He understood that defeating individual monsters wouldn't solve the problem entirely since the true boss remained undefeated. He decided to hold on until the final stage, where the final boss would appear. Meanwhile, Tadano and his friends fought for their lives against a demon soldier. Exhausted and on the verge of defeat, Tadano felt insecure, especially after witnessing Kusanagi defeat the demon soldier effortlessly. Tears streamed down his face as he cried for his perceived weakness. In that moment, he heard Kusanagi's voice responding to his self-doubt. Tadano saw a huge fire, and suddenly, the demon soldier disappeared, leaving only its legs behind. Kusanagi appeared and walked past them. Instead of thanking him, Tadano became furious, feeling humiliated by Kusanagi's repeated saves. He chased after Kusanagi, questioning why Kusanagi would save him and if he found him annoying. Kusanagi responded in a typical heroic fashion, stating that there was no particular reason for saving Tadano other than the fact that he was capable of doing so. However, Tadano's fragile ego couldn't accept this explanation, and he felt further humiliated. 